Well, everybody, contrary to what the clocks say, it really is 7 o'clock. And this, this is the highest tech we, we seem to be able to do here for, for timepieces. Uh, welcome to the first Science Unwrapped of the new season. And welcome to the first live audience for Science Unwrapped in a year and a half. So I'm, I'm happy to see people here. Thanks a lot for coming. My name's Greg Podgorski. In fact, as, while I speak, I, we encourage masks here, and masks are available. But while I speak, I'm going to take this, this mask off and, and stand back a bit. So my name's Greg Podgorski. I'm the Associate Dean in the College of Science. More importantly for this event, I'm the Chair of the Science Unwrapped Committee. And I'm really lucky to be Chair of that committee because there are a lot of really good members on that committee. In fact, every single one of them. And they, they really make these events possible in addition to speakers, as, uh, as we have tonight. And I'll introduce you to Dr. Kevin Moon in just a second. But, but anyway, we're really looking forward to the season this year. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about uh, the way Science Unwrapped goes. We always have a themed event for each year. Last year, it was just unbelievable timing because we decided to take a turn that was slightly dark. Our theme was Brave New World, and we never intended to have an overlap of a dark year with a dark theme, but there it was. Okay. Coming out of last year's talk, starting about April, things looked pretty rosy. And we thought, let's bookend Brave New World with something really positive, the hope and promise of science. And that's what we see here with science on the horizon. And it sure is an interesting story to see how things unfold with COVID, because although it's science on the horizon, our, our rosy outlook back in April may have been a little bit premature. But, okay, we still feel strongly, deep in our hearts, you know, within our bones, okay, that science provides hope, science provides answers. And that's, that's still what we're looking at in this year's talks for Science on the Horizons. Let me take a quick tour through these talks. Again, a little bit of uh, promotion. So Dr. Kevin Moon is with us tonight. I'll, I'll give a full introduction in a moment. He is opening the series with the idea of big data, data visualization, machine learning, and there's some really powerful, important things that can be done through those approaches. Okay. Our next speaker will be Dr. Nora Sarman from the USU Biology Department. And Dr. Sarman will be talking about global health. And she does some really interesting work on both the molecular level for emerging diseases and on a practical level, she tours uh, many regions of the developing world and looks at how to, to you know, control outbreaks of things like SARS-CoV-2. Okay. In November, the last of her fall talks, okay, we'll be hearing from Dr. Keith Roper, who is in the Biological Engineering Department at USU. And Dr. Roper will be talking about his work in tracking COVID through a number of different approaches, including monitoring wastewater. And he's doing work on that right now uh, on campus okay, through the fall semester. He's been doing that for a long time. Coming into our spring talks, okay, and although January hardly seems like spring in Logan, it's not, but our January talk is going to be from Dr. Mario Harper. It's got an intriguing title, Robots in a Human World. And Dr. Harper's work is on robotics, and actually a tie into Dr. Moon's talk tonight, machine learning and robotics. And I have a feeling he will have one of his, his pet robots here marching up and down the, the aisles in, in January. In February, we'll hear from Dr. Sarah Freeman from Animals to Autism. And Dr. Freeman does work in the neurobiology of bonding. So, so what makes different species, including us, bond to each other socially. In March. Uh, what goes up must come down, and that's, that's true, and I've learned that in skiing many times. And going up is more fun than coming down. But uh, Dr. Katie Potter from the Geosciences Department will be talking about carbon sequestration technologies. And then capping off our series, we'll hear from Dr. Reagan Zane of the Electrical Engineering Department. 
and Dr. Zane will be talking about electrification of roadways. The real title of this talk starts out, uh, oh, uh, gosh, it's Electric Avenues, all right? But he's, he's doing work in developing uh, wireless charging for electrical vehicles that I think is really groundbreaking technology. That, that's the series, but it's a hopeful look at applications of science. A few things about the talk tonight, and at least the talks through fall semester. As I said, uh, we're living in a time where we have to be ready to, to pivot on a moment, and we are ready to pivot on a moment. We have our bases covered tonight because we have a live audience here, and thanks again for coming. The talk is being streamed live to, to people at home, and thank you for viewing at home. Uh, and the talk will be recorded as well, and that's the way our fall talks will go. Um, we'll see what happens in spring. And, uh, and again, be ready to turn on a dime if we need to. For those of you at home, okay, if you have questions during the talk, please ask the questions via the chat feature of the AggieCast and that chat button. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty obviously labeled, ask a question. It lives in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. So feel free to ask questions during the talk and I will field those questions at the end of the talk. So uh, make sure you, yeah, any questions, ask away. One thing that's different, at least through fall semester for Science Unwrapped, is that we will have virtual after-talk activities. In fact, these are after-talk at any time, rather than our in-person activities. As soon as we can, as soon as the pandemic allows us, we will have in-person after-talk activities. But as I think, as we all know, this is not the time to pack people tightly together uh, in the halls just outside here. But as this slide will suggest, okay, there are a lot of online video activities. I encourage you to go to the Science Unwrapped website, take a tour of the activities, and try a bunch out. A lot of them, in fact, they're really fun, right? So, so please be aware of that. Um, and we, again, we really thank the volunteers for Science Unwrapped who have continued contributing to these events uh, during the pandemic through posting all these, these really excellent virtual activities. Okay. Let, me, let me shift now to introduce Dr. Keith Moon. And uh, I met Dr. Moon actually just last week, and it was a real pleasure. Okay. Keith is in the Mathematics and Statistics Department. Keith calls himself a data scientist, and he'll tell you what that means, and it means a lot of different things. Data science straddles many, many different disciplines. Uh, and Keith, as you'll see, has had extensive, Kevin, Kevin, because I get, you, you, there, there's, a, there's a reason for that, all right? And that is, there, there's a family relationship, and there are many moons, it turns out, all right? And, and Kevin is, is, is Keith's, well, Keith is your father-in-law, am I right? Todd, all right, I'll get it right, all right, yeah, all right. Kevin, so my apologies, Kevin, okay. So, but thanks for correcting me. So, as I said, I met Kevin just last week, right? And, uh, and it was a pleasure, okay? Kevin's published a lot in, in some of the most prestigious journals in the world. One of the things we'll see in Science Unwrapped this year is the interdisciplinary nature of modern science. And in Kevin's case, that's really true because Kevin's collaborated with geneticists, he's collaborated with astronomers, he's collaborated with engineers, and, and brings the power of data science to those disciplines. And, uh, and again, there are a lot of things you've done. I've been super impressed. Uh, just by way of education, okay, there's some bad news here because uh, Kevin indeed has a, a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in electrical engineering, but from BYU. So we can almost forgive Kevin for that. Um, but Kevin went on, all right, to get a master's in mathematics from the University of Michigan and a PhD from the University of Michigan back to electrical engineering. And then for me, my, my background is in biology and genetics, things start to get really interesting for me because as a postdoctoral researcher, uh, Kevin went on to Yale University where he worked in genetics and he worked in applied mathematics 
And so Kevin will make some references to that uh, tonight. Just a few personal notes, okay? Kevin is a Utah native who grew up in the Duchesne area. And I say in the Duchesne area because he grew up on a ranch, and we're just talking a multi-generational uh, ranch in Duchesne. Uh, Kevin is a proud father of four children. Uh, he loves to grill and smoke meat, and I think that says something about a ranching background. Uh, and Kevin is fluent in Spanish. Okay, so Kevin's talk is okay. Seeing science. Okay, the uh, so using machine learning to visualize data, and so with that, Kevin and my apologies too. Take it away. Thank you. I'm sure some of you will know better than me, but I believe there's a Keith Moon who was the lead drummer of The Who or something like that. that so it happens more often than I expect. I, I date Keith. myself, but I saw The Who play at Flushing Stadium in New York a long, long time ago. So that has to be it. <laughs> Well, I'm happy to be here tonight. I, I'm, I'm, I like to thank the committee for, for inviting me here. And as the title suggests, we're going to be talking about a few different things here, talking about machine learning, visualization, and data. So I'm going to spoil the talk for you at the beginning to make sure we're somewhat on the same, same page throughout. Uh, here's what we're going to start with. We're going to start talking about visualization, how humans are good at visualizing things. But scientific data is not one of them. Scientific data is generally large and very hard for us to see and understand what's going on with it. So on the other hand, computers are good at seeing and speaking in terms of math, which makes them good at analyzing data in contrast with humans. And also, computers can learn to make good visualizations from scientific data using math to help us better understand science. We're going to give some examples and describe what some of these things mean throughout the topic or throughout the talk. So this is where we're going. Let's start from the beginning. Most humans are very visual. Science has shown that up to 80% of basically everything we do can be filtered through our vision in some way, at least. And from an information perspective, this is also very true. You think about the, the total amount of information that our brain is processing across all of our senses, vision takes the cake by a long mile. And so the old saying that a picture is worth a thousand words might be better rephrased even as it's worth a million words in terms of content. And because of how much power or time our brain focuses on visualization, we're actually pretty good at using our visual system. So I'm going to show a picture up here for, for all of you. And as soon as you recognize what animal it is, I want you to raise your hand. Okay. So ready, set, go. Okay. Pretty good. A lot of you raised your hand pretty fast. Some of you didn't, so maybe you've never seen this before. That's okay. Uh, let's do another one. Ready? Also pretty fast. Okay, last one. A little bit more hesitant there. The mask may have thrown you off a little bit, right? But that's clearly a cat here. So it was pretty remarkable that just almost instantly, most of you at least, were able to recognize what the animal was. Your brain brought up the word in your mind what that animal was, and you recognized it. That's pretty remarkable. Um, and even you were also able to ignore a lot of the background that is in these images. You focused right on the animal itself. So given our capacity to visualize and recognize things like that, it makes sense that there's a lot of power in being able to visualize data and allowing us to better understand our world. In other words, do science. So here's an example. Suppose I gave you this little piece of information that Minecraft was about as popular in 2019 as it was in 2015, based on views on, on Twitch. Well, this is just one piece of data at, that maybe tells you generally what happened across a four-year period. But what happened in between? I could now tell you the, it, what, all the things that happened in that time frame, but that's not going to be as effective as showing you a plot of what happened. So here, if we look at this plot, we see that the popularity of Minecraft peaked at about in the middle of 2017 before dropping back down. You can also do some comparisons and see that, in contrast, Fortnite 
really jumped up in popularity around the beginning of 2018 before starting to level off. And you can see some other little details. For example, uh, let's see, uh, Minecraft jumped up in popularity again a little bit towards the middle of 2019. If you knew a little bit about the community in this area, you'd know that that was largely attributable to some uh, famous streamers, game streamers, that switched from Fortnite to Minecraft temporarily, causing their audiences to follow them as well. So the point is, just by looking at this visualization, you can get a lot more information than, and a lot faster than me just telling you what happened. Similarly, we can look at what happened uh, or we can look at U.S. housing prices as well. I could tell you that between 2011 and now, U.S. home prices nearly doubled in their prices, but that just gives you two data points, what happened in between. Looking at a graph tells us exactly what happened, and we see that there was a fairly steady growth up until about the, the end maybe of 2020, when, which there was a sharp increase. And we can also do some comparisons to individual states by looking at plotting the same graphs on the same axes. So in this case, we have the green one corresponding to the US, and here are the Utah home prices, which have increased at a faster rate than the US home prices, especially within this last year. If any of you had tried buying a house here in the last year or so, you would understand this very well. Uh, but in Michigan, the, it had basically the same trend as uh, the, the, the overall United States, just at lower prices, and Connecticut is an entirely different story, where it was pretty flat for the last decade up until the last year, to which it also had a large increase. So different stories that we can easily gather by just looking at things here, rather than me trying to tell you what the, the, the data are. Now, a lot of data, though, doesn't have time as any kind of component. Let me show you an example. So this is an old data set been around a long time, was collected back in 1936 by a famous statistician, and where he took and measured a bunch of measurements of some iris flowers. He looked at three different species, and he measured four different features per flower. First, he measured the petal length and width, and he also measured something known as the sepal length and width. In this case, the sepal corresponds to this petal-like structure that's a little bit different from the other smaller petals there. So, how do you visualize this kind of data, though? There, there's no time. Well, what you can do is you can look at different features plotted against each other. For example, we can plot the sepal width versus the sepal length, and each of these little dots or X's or triangles corresponds to a single measurement of a flower. So, for example, this one belongs, to, uh, this, this flower indicates it had a sepal length of about 5.5 centimeters and a sepal width of about 3.5 centimeters. So what do we learn from this visualization, just by looking at it? Well, one thing you can see is that species A is quite a bit different from the other two species. You can almost draw a line right between them and get perfect separation between them. So very different. We also see that there's a lot of variation within species. For example, in species C, there's a flower here that measured less than five centimeters in sepal length and another one that measured greater than 7.5 centimeters, so a large spread. And then finally, we see that species B and species C look like they're pretty much the same in terms of sepal, B, uh, sepal length and sepal width. Hard to distinguish between them. But remember, we measured four things. We're only looking at two. So let's look at the other two. And this is what we get. Very different visualization here. Uh, it, we still see that species A is very separable from the other two, but now species B and C are also decently separable, all just by looking at different variables. Now, by we only have four features total here, so it's pretty easy to compare all of our features in these different plots. You can look at sepal length versus sepal, petal width, and so on and so on and so on. And so if you have four features, it turns out you can have six unique plots that shows these comparisons with your different features. What if you have a data set, though, where you've measured more things, you have more features? You can actually calculate how many plots you need to be able to look at all these relationships. So four features equals six plots, five features, 10 plots. 10 features means you need 45 plots, 20, 190, 100 means 4950 features, so nearly 5,000. And finally, if you have 1,000 features, you need nearly 500,000 plots. That's a lot. 
If you were able to look at one plot per second, it would take you nearly six days to get through all of those plots. You know, no, not sleeping or anything. Don't recommend that. So, and a lot of data sets out there have even more than 1,000 features, such as a lot of gene expression data. So, but we can use computers. We can't see all those different features and look at them, but computers are good at looking at this. So they can help us out. Now, so let's shift a little bit. And given that computers can help us, let's try and understand a little bit better at how do computers actually see, or how do they look at data from their perspective. So consider this picture of a cat. What does it look like to a computer? Let's zoom in and see what it looks like. Let's look at the top of the ear there. And if you look at this ear zoomed in, notice these little boxes of color. These boxes are called pixels. So what does a pixel look like from a computer's perspective? Again, let's zoom in even further. So that's that little square that we highlighted there. And it turns out that each pixel has three numbers associated with it. One is a red number, another is green, and another is blue. So if you remember your primary colors, they were red, yellow, and blue. And you were told that mix those together and you can get any other color that you want from it. Turns out you can get the same by replacing yellow with green as well. So that's basically what's going on here. So what this tells us is that the way computers see things is in numbers. In other words, a computer's natural language is math. So if you look at this picture again, what does the computer see? A bunch of numbers. And so how do you get a computer to recognize whether there's a cat in here? Basically what you have to do is you have to have the computer scan all of the pixels in this image, looking at them and seeing do the, the patterns of numbers match the pattern that it expects for a cat. Now, it does it very fast, because computers are fast, but it's very different from the way you and I see this picture. When we see this picture, we immediately focus in right on the cat, and we ignore all the other pixels. A computer doesn't do that. It's different. So there's some good news with this. And the good news is that a lot of scientific data are numbers. For example, a lot of biological data, as well as seismic data, where, which measure how much the Earth is moving during an earthquake, Blood work, if you ever get your blood drawn and they look at it, they can uh, get a lot of measurements from that, such as the iron content, the lead, et cetera, as well as species numbers in ecology and many other applications. It's numbers. So what that means is, since computers are good with numbers, they can be very helpful in analyzing these kinds of data and giving us information from them. But there's some bad news. The bad news is computers only do what you tell them to do. I'm sure many of you have felt like this guy sometimes when you're working with your computer, if it doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. They can't read our minds, unfortunately, right? So that's where data science comes in. The goal of data science is to have, figure out how to tell computers to do what we want them to do in order to get information from data. There's some challenges with this, and that, that's that a lot of um, new methods of a, collecting data are rather new. And so what that means is a lot of the old data science methods don't always apply. They're still very useful in a lot of contexts, but sometimes there are certain problems where they just don't quite work out. And so that means we need new data science methods that are able to get the information that we need so that humans can do science with that data. And that's where the data science researchers like myself come in. We work with scientists and other fields, we discuss with them the kinds of data that they have or that they're collecting and what they'd like to learn from that data. And we work with them to figure out how to get that information from it. And it's a lot of fun. So take a water break here for a second. So there are two main ways to tell a computer what to do. Because that's what we want to do, right? We want to tell it how to get the information from the data. First is give it a direct set of instructions. So simple example, if the user is moving the mouse, it move, you, the user moves it to the right a little bit, you program the computer to move the cursor on the screen to the right as well, a certain amount. Pretty simple. Another example, if a program starts playing some kind of sound or music and the speakers are not muted, then you program the computer to send that signal to the speakers so that you can hear it. 
something a bit more complex. If you're playing chess against the computer and it decides that it can take the to capture your queen without putting itself in danger of checkmate, then it should do it. Now this last example is quite complex because think about the instructions you have to get, give to the computer for it to do that. First, the computer has to recognize and understand what it means to capture a piece. It has to understand what checkmate is and it has to understand what kinds of moves it can make as well as what the other person can make and try and predict what those moves might be to figure out if it's making a bad move or a good move. Pretty complex and the programmer has to explicitly say all of those things to the computer, tell it how to do that. So it gets pretty hard. The second way that you can tell a computer how to do things is tell it how to learn from examples instead or data. Now, this is a little bit cheating because you still have to do the first way, but instead of giving it the explicit instructions for the task you want it to do, you instead give it the instructions for how to learn to do what you want it to do. So an example, going back to the game playing one, such as chess, instead of ex explicitly telling it which moves to make, you instead give it the rules to the computer and have it play against itself thousands or maybe even millions of times until it figures out a good strategy. This was done by some people at Google. They created this program called AlphaGo. There's a documentary about it on Netflix right now. And this is what they did. Go is a game that was invented in China, considered more complex than chess. So they had it play against itself, I don't know how many times, long, lots of times. And then they had it play against the world champion of Go. It won four out of the five matches quite handily. And then they let it play against itself a bunch more times and then the, the champion could never beat it again. So it solved the game of Go. And something that was interesting too is that as the, the, you know, the Go players, they were watching the computer make its moves, it would make moves that they had never seen before. And at first they thought, that's kind of a dumb move. Why did it do that? But then they saw that several moves later, it set it up to win. And so it was inventing new moves that humans had never seen before just by playing against itself. So there's a lot of, this second way of doing things is called machine learning. So what do you think of when you think of the word, words, machine learning? You might think of a robot like this, or maybe even a robot like this. Now, uh, machine learning will play a role in the future of robots, and I'm sure it currently is playing a role, as Dr. Harper will show us here in a few months. But for the most part right now, it hasn't been fully realized. There are some barriers that prevent it from being fully explored. But machine learning is having a large impact in a lot of other fields right now as well. So here's an ex a very simple example of how machine learning can be very powerful and, much more, and work much better than other ways of doing programming. So let's consider this picture of a cat again. And suppose you had a friend who had never seen a cat before. There might be some people in here who haven't because they didn't raise their hands ever for recognizing the picture. But how would you go about I want to get some volunteers. How, how would you describe a cat to someone who's, who's never seen one before? Yes. Um, they have sharp claws. Claws? Yeah? They're small and have lots of fur. Small and have lots of fur. Good. Any other suggestions? Yes. Um, they have whiskers and fuzzy. Whiskers and fuzzy, yes. Yeah, they have, their pupils might be different from some other animals, like, more like reptiles. Good. Now, suppose you were talking to a computer, though. How would you describe a cat, picture of a cat to a computer? Remember, computers don't think in terms, they don't know what whiskers or fur or pupils even are. They just see numbers. Very different, right? Very different from the way we think. And that's, that's the point then. So this plus some other challenges actually make image recognition very hard to do with computers compared to the way you and I do it. Uh, let's look at some other challenges exist that make this a hard problem. So consider now instead of cats we're looking at dogs and specifically golden retrievers. We want to know if a picture contains a golden retriever or not. And one challenge that comes up is just by moving the camera over a little bit or even flipping the image makes it look very different from the computer's perspective. 
To us, it looks very similar. We immediately see that it was just flipped, but the remember the computer sees numbers, and so there are very different numbers in very different spots. Makes it hard for it. Another challenge, lighting. We can see pretty easily that these are all golden retrievers, but each of those little pixel values are very different from the computer's perspective. Very different numbers. How does it know that this is a dog still, or even a golden retriever? Deformation, in other words, different shapes. This makes it hard for the computer to recognize that these are all golden retrievers. They're in different positions. Uh, hiding. If a part of the dog isn't visible, how does the computer know that that's actually a dog? If you told it that a dog is an animal with four legs and a tail, if it doesn't see four legs, it says, that's not a dog, because that's what I was told. You and I recognize that, though. Uh, other challenges, if there's a lot going on in the background, remember the computer has to look at all the pixels. And so that might throw it off, whereas you and I, we can focus in easily. And finally, there's a lot of different ways golden retrievers can look. These are all golden retrievers, very different colors, very different pixel numbers. Looks very different from the computer's perspective. So the point of this is, if you tried the first approach to telling a computer how to do things, you know, try and describe a dog looks like this and this and this and has these numbers in it, that's going to be very hard to account for all these differences, you know, all these different changes and conditions. But if you do machine learning, it's actually not too hard. Because what you have to, all you have to do is you have to have a bunch of images with some of them with golden retrievers in them and some of them without. Give that to the computer, tell them which are which, and it will figure it out. It'll figure out the difference. So it's very similar to the way that you and I learned when we were children. Uh, probably for the most part, you, you learned whether something was a chair by some of your, your parents or siblings saying, pointing to that and saying chair or railing or stairs, that you figured it out by listening and by giving, giving examples. So there's a lot of power that comes in machine learning in solving some of these hard problems. Here's a scientific example where we, you can use machine learning to do cancer diagnosis. You can do this by giving the, the machine learning method a bunch of examples of images of chest x-rays. Some of those images will, have, uh, will be of healthy people, no cancer. Some will contain cancer. And by giving them all those images, the computer will be able to figure out which ones have cancer or not. So there's a lot of power in machine learning, and it's had a lot of effect in science as well. Uh, for example, it's been used to assist with GPS denied navigation. So if you're flying a drone, don't have access to GPS, you want to know where you are and where you're going, you can use machine learning. Uh, analyzing solar images to predict solar flares, identifying regions of the brain associated with epileptic seizures, cleaning biological data, analyzing the blood of patients with Zika or dengue favor, uh, analyzing the brain development in simple worms. Now these are just some of the examples that I personally have worked on. A lot of other researchers are working on other problems, such as uh, material science, chemistry, self-driving cars, fraud detection, speech recognition, et cetera. Uh, your cell phone is doing machine learning almost all the time. It's learning about you. If you're using Google Maps or Google Search or any recommendation system, such as from Amazon or TikTok, it's all using machine learning. Voice recognition, your voice commands, machine learning. Uh, in particular, the TikTok example. What is it doing? It's looking, it's keeping track of how long you're watching each video, and then it figures out the videos you watched longer, those are the kinds of videos it's going to feed to you via machine learning. So it knows everything about you, right? So machine learning is powerful, but let's learn a little bit about how it actually works. How do machines learn? Because they're different from us. How does it work? Let's consider this old iris data set again, and let's think. Suppose you had, we wanted to learn how to predict whether a new flower measurement should belong to species A or species B. How would you do that? Just by looking at this data, is there something you could do that would maybe predict whether one belongs to the other? Yeah. Yeah, so you could basically draw some kind of threshold or some line somewhere in this big gap, right? So you could draw a line, or this, so this problem is known as classification, and you could draw a line right there, or there, or there. Now looking at these three lines, is there one that you would say that's probably a better line? Let's make a vote. 
Who thinks the blue line over here is the best one? Raise your hand. What about the black one? Red. A lot of people voting for red. Why? And you're right, the red one is the better one. Anyone have some kind of explanation of why they thought maybe the red is better? Yeah. Yeah, so I think what you're saying here is that like the area on both sides is kind of the same, isn't it? So what would happen if we measured a new ex example of species B, but it was a little bit smaller than the ones we've already collected? It's probably still going to be on this side of the line, so we're going to get it right. On the other hand, if we measured one of species A that's a little bit bigger, it's probably still going to be on this side of the line and we're going to get it right. Whereas if you looked at the blue one, right, you might get it wrong because it could cross over there on accident or the black one as well. Now, so that makes sense to us. Remember, computers think in numbers. So how would you describe this from a number perspective? Well, what you could do is you could look at the distance from this line to the closest points in the, the two types of species. And you could say, let's just make those distances as big as they can. In other words, let's maximize these distances. Well, so that tells us actually how machine learning works. It's via something known as optimization. So optimization means to make something as good as it can be. In other words, you want to maximize it or minimize it. It turns out that humans do a fair amount of optimization in our lives as well. Some examples include you, uh, health officials are interested in minimizing the amount of lead that occurs in the environment, as lead is very harmful to humans and particularly children. Uh, if you're on a football team, you want to maximize the number of wins that you have in a season. And people generally probably want to minimize the amount of pain that you might uh, encounter in life. Now, we may not always be successful at these optimization problems, right? In particular, you may be interested in minimizing pain, but we also like to enjoy life. And so sometimes there are competing optimizations. For example, if you're a football player, you like to play football. Uh, you're probably going to get hurt somewhat, at least, and so you can't necessarily minimize pain the whole time while enjoying your football. We also encounter sometimes constraints in our lives. Uh, for example, you may want to maximize the total amount of time that you're playing video games, but you don't want to get in too much trouble, so you don't want your mom to get mad. Or you really like pizza and you want to maximize the amount of pizza you eat without getting a stomachache, because that's no fun now at that point. And also businesses, they have these this constraints. They want to maximize profits, but they only have access to a certain amount of resources, money, people, et cetera. So optimi machine, uh, optimization forms the backbone of machine learning. It's how it works. Uh, for example, in the chess one, you can frame the problem as we want to maximize our reward or maximize the amount of times that you win. In the classification problem, we want to minimize how often we're guessing the wrong one. And there's also regression, which is another kind of problem where you want to minimize how uh, much you are wrong, how, how big of your, a guess you might be wrong by. And all, all of these optimization problems involve calculus and linear algebra. In other words, math. So we're going to have a summary so far. Catch up anyone that might have been dozing a little bit. So key facts that we've covered so far. First, humans are pretty good at identifying visual patterns. Computers are not by themselves. Humans are pretty bad, though, at thinking beyond two to three dimensions, beyond things that we can visualize. Well, computers are not. Data are usually numbers, which means extracting meaning from data requires math. Computers basically live and breathe math. And, so, and also, machine learning helps computers solve hard problems. So given all these key facts, we can conclude that let's use machine learning to visualize data so that it can be useful to us. So that's where we're going right now. How can we use machine learning to visualize data? To wrap up. Remember this, da this data set? If we looked at all the pairs of, of, data, of features, we have six plots. And if you started getting more, much more than four features, you have a lot of plots. Remember, 1,000 features gives you nearly 500,000 plots. We can't do that. So we need to figure out a way to take all the information and all these features and make it simple for, enough for humans to understand and visualize. So let's look at these kinds of plots, though, and think about 
what are we really looking at here? What are we learning from this? Well, consider this data point here that I've circled there. What's its relationship to the other ones right around it? It's pretty close to a lot of those other data points that are around it. What that means is it's fairly similar to all the data points there. On the other hand, this data point that's over here is kind of far from everything else, suggesting that it's different. It's quite a bit smaller than the others within its same species. So can we extend this same idea to larger number of features? That's what we want to do. We want to take a, a data set that has lots of features, thousands or more than thousands, and we want to create this kind of visualization where points that are close together are similar to each other, and points that are far apart are different. A lot of people have tried to do this and come up with lots of different methods. Uh, and the, the, the different methods become different based, based on how you define similar or different. A lot of them have weaknesses, so that motivated me and my colleagues to invent the one that we call fate. Um, it's my talk, so I can talk about it, right? So let's look at some examples of applying fate to real scientific data. The first one here is EEG measurements of the brain. So how they collected this data is they put a cap on the person's head, and within that cap you have these electrodes that measure the electrical signals that are coming from your brain. And then you sit there, they have them fall asleep, and so we're tracking their brain activity through different sleep stages. And we visualized this data using fate and got the following, where we're coloring it based on the different sleep stages. So there are a few things we can learn from this. First, we see here that the data points corresponding to the awake stage are generally close to the ones that correspond to REM stage. Rapid eye movement is what that stands for. And this is pretty no well known to, re to researchers. They, they have already known beforehand that brain activity when someone is sleeping or when they're awake is very similar to the REM stage. And we also found some different interesting paths that connect between these stages, indicating that the way your brain transitions from one sleep stage to another might differ depending on the time of day that, or the time that you're sleeping there. So some interesting things here that we can look into further. Another data set, this is uh, images taken from a video. A guy sat in front of a camera and made a bunch of faces is what it all is. And we can visualize this using fate as well. Here are the three dimensions, or three, a three-dimension representation. Uh, and you can see we have lots of different branches, and each of these branches corresponds to a different pose or a different face that the guy was making. And there's some other interesting global structure as well that we see here. On the left side, this is mostly uh, his faces where he's looking kind of grumpy or serious, whereas the faces on the right are the, the happy and, and smiling ones. And let's see if this video works. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it is working here. So here we're showing the, the video as it corresponds to some of the different uh, faces. First one, he was uh, sticking his tongue out, and the second one, he, he made a duck face. Let's watch that again, right? So tongue sticking out, the next one's going to be his, the duck face. The whole video is on YouTube, look, going tra uh, traversing through the whole thing. So if you're extra bored on a different Friday night, you can go home and watch that all night. So, the point, but we can see interesting structure using fate from this high, high feature data set. Final example here, you can also visualize data that you might get from social media websites such as Facebook. In this case, the data that's given in are basically, it's, it indicates whether someone, people are friends with each other or not. And the color of the dots corresponds to the number of friends each person has. And we can see there's some interesting network structure here where these people seem to be fairly friends with each other within this group. And then there's another group that are more friends with each other as well, not so much with other people. And you have some people that kind of connect between them. This is pretty what, much what you might expect in real life as well. Uh, you may have different circles of friends where they, there may not be a, much, a lot of overlap between those friends. Maybe you do band, but also you do basketball, and there isn't much overlap between those. But, and you're the, one of those connecting points between them. And so this is useful for identifying influencers and other things like that, that within social media. So how does something like fate work? A lot of math. And that's all we're going to say about it. <laughs> going further. So 
there's a lot more to data visualization than just looking at these kinds of plots. There's a, there's a whole field in there, and we barely scratched the surface on it. There are a lot of challenges that exist. For example, avoiding deceptive visualizations. If you go to a lot of news sources or influencers on any side of any issue, and most of them are going to be trying to use deceptive graphics that try and deceive you. Um, also, there's a challenge of just figuring out how to communicate the information in a way that's useful for people. And there are a lot of other researchers here at USU involved in this work that are doing a lot of good work here as well. Conclusion. So we've established humans are generally very visual in the way we perceive our world. Scientific data has a lot of features which make it hard for humans to visualize just by looking at the data. On the other hand, computers are very good with math and numbers, and machine learning in particular helps computers translate those numbers into information in a way that's easy for us to understand and visualize, which is great for advancing science. And then the final concluding remark, if you want to beat or join the robots in the robot revolution, study math, because that will be their language that they use. Any questions? Yeah, just asking about tensor mathematics. Do you use that at all? Uh, yes, but mostly under the hood. So a tensor, a tensor is, for, for those who understand, well, a tensor is a generalization of a, of a matrix where you're ta stacking matrices on top of each other. And, and yes, there, there's a lot of operations that are using tensors in certain machine learning algorithms. So uh, it's very complex math. Uh, most of the time, most, most programmer, programmers that are using these kinds of methods don't necessarily need to understand that. But if you want to be the kind of people that are making these, these methods faster and better and more powerful, you do need to understand those kinds of methods. So. There's some back there. Oh, is it an R yes, R, Python, and MATLAB. Um, what are some, do you have like any other examples of? Oh. Uh, do you have any other examples of like how you used fate to um, like track data? Yes, yeah, so we've also looked at uh, a lot of biological data in particular, such as uh, gut microbiome data. In that case, what they do is people took basically fecal samples, we'll call it that, and they sent them into people and they counted the number of bacteria in each of those samples. And you can compare those and see that there's differences between certain people and the way that their gut composition is. We've also looked at developmental biology, so like stem cells and how it branches out. You can use that to identify different new cells and things like that. So uh, it has like 200 citations or more, so a lot of people have been using it. Um, um, how many pictures would a computer have to see of a cat to recognize a cat? Very good question. A lot more than probably you, is what I'd say. Uh, a lot of these, to really get good at them, often the computers need to see like millions of images. Uh, and that might not be just for cats, but if you have like a thousand different things you want a computer to recognize, like a car, or a bench, a chair, a person, a cat, you need probably about on the order of a million, at least with current technology, current, current machine learning methods. Good question. So a follow-up to that, how is quantum computing going to change kind of data visualization and what you're doing? Good question. Uh, and if, if it works, we'll put that caveat there. If quantum computing worked, it could speed up a lot of, uh, a lot of things. Because um, for a lot of these kinds of methods, sometimes it can take a long time to train them. Uh, I'll give you some examples here. So if, if, have any of you heard of GPT-3? That is a modern machine learning architecture that was trained by, I believe, OpenAI. I believe they're some Google subsidiary. Anyway, basically, you can input it a paragraph, and it will generate a whole article based on that paragraph. So that's, that's not images. That's more like text-based. Um, someone estimated that the amount of time and power that they took to train that 
cost on the order of $10 million. So just to learn that to cost $10 million. Something like quantum computing, if it worked, could probably speed up that training. And assuming quantum computing is not that expensive, would really save a lot of power, uh, money and power. So good question. So quick question, do you see any glitches that happens in machine learning and how do you combat it? Yes, so probably one of the biggest uh, problems occurs when you have bad information given to the machine learning algorithm itself. We call, these, uh, we call them labels. So uh, remember the pictures of the dogs? Suppose there were a bunch of images though where there wasn't a dog and you told the computer there's a dog there or vice versa. There were images without a dog or with a dog and you said there wasn't a dog there. Or if you said that a person really is a fish. So these kinds of glitches happen in a lot of these labeled data sets, and that can makes, makes it hard for the computer to figure it out. So right? is it human error or A lot of it's human error. Uh, and you may have also heard of potential bias within machine learning algorithms as well. In my opinion, most of that is due to the bias inherent in the data set itself. Say, for example, you're taking uh, interview data, so like you do like a video interview of someone, there are companies out there that try and take those videos and determine whether you should hire or not that person. And it's based on these labels that humans have given it. If there is racial bias in the labels that were given, the machine learning will also learn that same racism. But it probably won't find the racism on its own without the labeled data. Uh, so. In your examples, you showed like a machine being able to identify like cats or cars or, or objects like that. Are we to the point that uh, a computer could look at an image and see someone and label it like sad or maybe something a little more complex? Yes, there are people working on emotion type classification, right? We're determining whether someone's uh, doing that. Yes, I want to go back to your question here a little bit too. Because I kind of implied that it's only the humans that are the problem, right? That's actually not 100% true. Uh, there are, some of these algorithms can be somewhat sensitive. There was an example given a few years ago where some researchers, they took a stop sign, a picture of a stop sign, and they put just kind of a small sticker on it that added some, something that for a human is easy to ignore. But the machine learning then classified it as a panda. So, there are these subtle, weird things sometimes that can happen that make the machine learning methods maybe not so robust is the way we say it. And that can, can be, you can fool it. Uh, so people are working on ways to combat that as well. So there are some glitches that can happen. People learning. Thanks. Could, could machine learning sometimes be better than us? Yes. So if there were, say, physicians are looking at an x-ray and they say it's clean, and the machine learning says, oh no, I've seen enough of this, this is cancer. I would trust the machine learning over the physician. Okay. Because it's probably looking at that, the results of thousands of other physicians, not just that one physician. Now, I might be unique though, right? A lot of people don't trust the computer over the physician. But, so, so probably where, where machine learning would be most helpful in that context is it can maybe give you kind of the form of a second opinion and tell the doctor, hey, I found something here. You should maybe take a closer look and make sure that you're giving the right diagnosis. It's probably where it would most likely end up happening rather than replacing doctors entirely. Is machine learning fast? Yes. Faster than you, most likely, in doing a lot of things. Depending on your computer, of course, right? But even your phones are pretty fast now in doing things faster than a, a lot of humans can. Is machine learning smarter than us? Good question, very good question. So it depends, what do you mean by smarter, right? So can machine learning be better than us maybe at recognizing whether someone has cancer or not? Possibly, uh, if you give it enough data of the right kind, then yes. But can it write better than us? Can it really dive and be creative and understand things better than us? No, not right now. Maybe in the future, but probably not, in my opinion. Um, so there are a lot of things, we, we humans still have a lot of strengths that computers don't. And that's kind of 
somewhat of the part of the point of my whole, my talk as well is that humans we are good at visualizing things and we're good at figuring out those patterns. Computers are not, and so it's actually kind of more of a, of a, a, uni, a marriage, you might say, between in, in this sense, in that the computers are taking the high, the, the large data, and giving us a way to be able to understand it better. And, but the computer itself can't really understand it on its own right now. Very good question. So when it comes to the human end of machine learning, how much mathematical interpretation has to happen to get the raw data into a workable state? So are you talking about the person like, like that's looking at the visualization or, or? Like putting the data into the computer to, to make the machine learn. Uh, it depends kind of on what software you're using, right? There is a big push uh, of trying to make these kinds of methods as easy to use as possible for, so that you don't have to have very much mathematical understanding. And I'd say we're largely there for a lot of problems. Um, I'd say where it's probably not as likely is actually in scientific type data, where the data are more complex than what you might get from just kind of basic business data or images, things like that. But where you're looking at scientific biological data, chemistry data, where things are more complex, it's it's not just plug and play that you might say. So the more you understand of kind of the way it works, the better you'll be able to interpret the results right now. But that could change over years, right? Um, can machines become so smart that they could become dangerous? Good question. So I, will the robot revolution happen, you might be asking, right? So. Uh, so what you're referring to here is known sometimes as general artificial intelligence, where computers become self-aware and then they take over the world, right? Things like that. Um, I, we would need, a lot of changes would need to happen before that could occur, ever. I per, we, the way we currently do machine learning, we're not going to get there. There would have to be some change in the way that we do things. There'd have to be a change in the way we computers work. We're kind of almost hitting some kind of wall in terms of computational power. If you've ever heard of Moore's law, that basically stated that computational power keeps going up and up and up and up and up. We're starting to hit those limits. And without shifting to different ways of doing things, we're probably not going to get there. And in particular, we probably need to understand better how biological brains work because they're very efficient. They use very little power, and yet they're very powerful a lot of things. So once we figure out how our brains work pretty well, and if we can make computers do the same, then we might be in trouble, you might say. But long ways away. I, I, I don't think it will ever happen, personally. But I'm maybe too skeptical. Do you see this kind of work with visualization of data also occurring with qualitative data sets? Yes, so uh, by, by qualitative data set, that would be something like where uh, you're, you're not working with numbers so much. It's more like if you, you go to the doctor and you're talking to them, they're going to write down maybe how you, they ask, how are you feeling, what have you happened, what's happened to you, and th that's kind of qualitative data, things that aren't easily translatable to numbers. Um, there are people working on those kinds of problems. Uh, there's a lot of work on what's known as natural language processing, which means given a bunch of words or sentences, can you extract information from that? Um, so yes, people are working on that. It's very hard though. It's a very, probably the, it's one of the harder problems. And one, way that one thing that illustrates how hard that is, you think about, you know, our brains are quite large relative to our size. We have lots of neurons. The largest machine learning methods have not gotten very close to that yet. They're probably more on the order of the size of frogs. Uh, and you think about what a frog does, it can recognize images, it recognizes things that are of danger to it, but it doesn't have real, uh, recognize human speech. So things like human speech and writing is a more, are more complex than images. And that's re reflected there. So that's kind of where people are working hard on, but we're a ways off from there still.
can computers do vi division? Yes. They can do all, uh, any math you can do, they can do. Probably better, too. <laughs> Except for proving things. That's, that's harder. Mathematical proofs. Do you think natural language processing could be used to translate speech directly into computer code? Uh, people are working on that right now. I think someone just released a program that tries to do that. Um, so the answer is probably yes to varying degrees of success. Um, the more obviously, the more complex code you want it to do, the harder that that's going to work. Because for one, it's going to be hard for you to kind of even state what, exactly what you want it to do. Um, but yeah, people are working on that right now. And, and final thanks, I want to thank our College of Science ambassadors who have helped with seating and have, have done aerobic and probably even anaerobic work moving the mic around tonight. And I also want to thank USU Media Productions who will make the streaming possible and the recording possible. And finally, I want to thank you for coming out tonight and making our first event this year, I think, a great success. So thanks for coming out. It's much appreciated. Okay, take care. Keep well.